my new book in the memoir. And it's a fun example to read. So this gets to my long, long life. <laughs> um, to a point when uh, in, 19, in 2009, there we go, history was generating increased attention to climate change. You remember that. And I was eager to dance with it. So were other Quakers who collectively sensed a calling to do more than we had been doing. The existing ecology of Quaker organizations working on climate, which included advocacy groups, had an empty niche available for a direct action oriented rebel style organization, the role that this new organization would play, fill. Even though I had asserted decades earlier that environment would become a key arena for struggle for a just world, I'd focused on other issues in my activism. Now I was ready to mentor those new to direct action in a dynamic campaign to force the seventh largest bank in the United States, PNC Bank, to give up its practice of of financing mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia. That's what they were, they were the number one financer of that. Well, the PNC Bank near the White House was our first choice for our civil disobedience action that would kind of inaugurate, you know, the, our, our deal, our campaign. And two of the Swarthmore students that I was teaching, I was a professor at Swarthmore at the time, joined the dozen and a half activists who were ready to be so bold as to do this. The bank was nicknamed the President's Bank because so many White House occupants over the years did their personal banking there. The walls were covered with oil paintings of presidents and other eminent depositors of yesterday, it, yesteryear. It was very impressive. So we went into the bank along with other tourists and looked at the paintings before gathering in the center of the lobby to form a circle. We started singing movement songs and took turns praying and singing. I was afraid the bank manager was gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> he began to shriek, get out of here, get out of here, before remembering to call the police. <laughs> The students that were in our circle were a little worried too, like what was this guy gonna do? The manager hustled other customers out of the bank, sent the tellers home, locked the door. One of our Equate members, we called our group Equate, one of our Equate members had been assigned to talk down the manager, but she had her hands full. None of us expected full-blown hysteria. The manager, by the way, later came to us and apologized. <laughs> Another Equate member was assigned door duty, which was a good thing because when the police came, our Equate member needed to unlock the locked door to let them in. <laughs> Fortunately, before the police arrived, we had time to center ourselves, seated around a little hill of dirt that we had created from the baggies that we had secreted on our bodies. And there was a little sign on the top of this little hill of dirt that said, save me. We even, had, we even got to settle into some good moments of silent prayer. The police told our person at the door that they didn't intend to arrest us because their system was clogged. This was because our action was planned to coincide with a much larger day of actions in D.C. by thousands of people concerned with mountaintop removal coal mining, including many from Appalachia itself. Eager for our action to unfold with the drama we had planned, our Equate member insisted that the police at least make some arrests. <laughs> Eventually, they agreed to take three of us and allowed us to decide who. In our circle, we quickly decided on a Swarthmore student, an activist from Chicago, and me. So began our group, Equate's rebel activity that persisted for the five years it took to win. We undertook 125 actions and inspired customers to pull their deposits of over $3.5 million. The 125 actions were usually in banks, in the actual banks, but a couple of them were in shareholders uh, meetings as well because a bank has to have an annual shareholders meeting. Right. We learned to hold pray-ins and disrupt shareholders meetings, a typical Equate demonstration had an age range of 18 to 80, but sometimes we were able to include eager children. 
Haverford College and Bryn Mawr College students also joined in to swell the college age contingent. We started in 2009 with a group that fit in my living room. Yeah, it was smaller than this, smaller group. And by December, uh, and we kept growing. And by December 2014, we were able to conduct within 24 hours a total of 31 bank actions in 12 states and Washington, D.C. It became clear to the bank leadership that our group would keep growing and growing and never go away until the bank changed its policy. In their announcement, they said their change was, quote, driven by environmental and health concerns as well as our risk appetite. <laughs> <laughs> After a growing number of Swarthmore students cut their teeth with Equate, they shifted to addressing Swarthmore's own investment in fossil fuels. Some had taken my research seminar and understood what campaigns are made of, and they also had the model of our organization to observe. They soon launched a nonviolent campaign for divestment, and one of my students warned me my time with Swarthmore would probably end pretty soon now because it would be easy for the board to blame me for the student's action. Perhaps so, but I stayed on at Swarthmore for several years more. Once the Swarthmore divestment campaign, which was called Mountain Justice, was well underway, the students issued a national call to other students to come to Swarthmore to launch a national campus divestment movement. The business page of the New York Times covered the movement's rapid spread and traced its origins to my students who in turn said they were inspired by me. Soon, the seniors who'd worked on those campaigns graduated, and some of them holed up in a rented house in my neighborhood in West Philly. There, they studied more and planned their next big move. With others, in 2017, they ended up launching the Sunrise Movement, and I couldn't have been more proud, not only because of their national media coverage that they got, but also of their staying power in organizing young eco-activists across the nation to press in creative ways for a Green New Deal. The Biden bill that passed, you know, just recently includes strong elements of the Biden, uh, of the Green New Deal, which my students had inaugurated by, you may remember, sitting in Pelosi's office, yes. right? Right? and saying, we've got this Green New Deal, we expect you to introduce it to Congress. And she said, no way, no way. You don't understand. <laughs> hmm? She said, you don't understand to the students. Yeah, right. And they're like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> you, you, you don't understand. <laughs> oh, what fun they had. The students <laughs> understood from my classes that drama can be really helpful in, in uh, raising an issue to the to the top, and uh, it certainly did. And I was struck by the, the result of that drama because, uh, of course, the media covered it very quickly, right, all over the, the country. So then the, the uh, poll takers rushed out to get uh, poll results. Do you favor the new Green New Deal? What do you think of the Green New Deal? The it, results I thought were so interesting. The Democrats' majority said, oh yeah, Green New Deal sounds good to us. But the Republicans, also, majority said, Green New Deal sounds good to us. Which required Fox News to work overtime to try to you know, pull the Republicans back uh, to line up properly. Uh, so it's been a very interesting introduction for me of what a vision, which also Sue has been talking about, what a vision of what you want can do politically. If it's a vision that makes sense to people, it's not gonna just divide on party lines. There'll be Republicans who'll say, whoa, that makes sense, let's have, let's have that, right? And that's really, really promising. Because one of the things that probably bothers uh, you, I know it bothers me, is the polarization that's going on in our country. How many of you would say that the polarization is really, really kind of natter nattering at you? Yeah. And uh, I totally identify with that because a dozen years ago, it was really bothering me a lot. And I say a dozen years ago because my field is sociology. And sociologists have a kind of um, occupational inclination in our heads whenever we're looking at any social system, whether it's as small as a family or as large as a, as a country, we're fascinated with the question, how integrated is it, how cohesive, as compared with how split 
open. It is. We just can't help noticing that. <laughs> so a dozen years ago, I was tracking the polarization, noticing, noticing, and I was getting worried because I thought, how can we make real progress on racial justice, on economic justice, all the things that matter? How can we make real progress if we're just like, you know, screaming at each other, throwing darts at each other, that kind of thing? But at the same time, I was researching for a book which really opened my mind to another possibility. The, the people I was researching was the Nordic peoples, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland. And I was wondering not only how they got such great societies compared with ours, way more individual freedom, more uh, re reduction of poverty to practically zero, tremendous, you know, free higher education, just all kinds of advantages that they've got that we don't have. And I was wondering, how did, when was it that they made their breakthrough? Because 100 years ago, they were a mess, frankly. I mean, some of you probably know families that came from those countries that were coming 100 years ago because those countries were, you know, get out of town. We want to, we want to go to a country that's got it, got it together, like the U.S., as compared with those countries. And they, they, uh, the people were le who were left were who were bereft. I mean, think of how many family members had gone to the U.S. instead. Um, they were thinking, we've got to do something to improve our country. What can we do? I noticed that it was in the 1920s and 30s that they made their big leap forward. That was the, the point. And that was also, though, the time when it was the most polarized that those societies had been in modern times. Nazis were marching in Norway. Nazis were marching in Denmark. In Sweden, Nazi, growing Nazi movement. I thought, well, how can that be? And on the other extreme, it was the big period of, for the Communist Party. Communists were busy organizing, inspired by the Soviet Union. They were hoping to take over the government and create, you know, uh, uh, that kind of society. I mean, I would call that a difference of opinion between the Nazis <laughs> and the communists, right? Tremendous clashes going on in those societies, and that was exactly the time that they made their big leap forward. Well, that totally contradicts my impression of what goes on in polarized times. I thought we'd get log jammed in polarized times, but they were getting, they were liberating themselves during, during uh, polarized times. How can this be? So, I thought, well, George, uh, since you're in such a puzzle, keep looking for other cases. You're supposed to be a sociologist. You're interested in cases. What about the 1930s in the United States? That's the decade I was born in. I'm ancient. Some of you have heard of ancient people who were <laughs> born, born in the 30s. And uh, yeah, the 1930s, well, that decade was tremendously full of contradiction, wasn't it? I mean, the Nazis were strong enough they could fill Madison Square Garden for a rally. Growing like mad, the Nazis were. And on the other hand, it was the glory period of the American Communist Party. Whew. Ku Klux Klan, killing people, lynching all over the place. I mean, it's tremendous, tremendous ferment that was going on in the 1930s and I would argue that was the period of greatest progress that we made in the first half of the 20th century. You can see I'm in more and more trouble. <laughs> like, what? How do I reconcile these facts? So I fast forward to the 1960s. What was going on then? Well, some of you will remember now. Come on, come on, come on. Some of you will remember the 1960s. Would you say that was a particularly placid um, <laughs> Period of uh, <laughs> high <schools> are <laughs> the Nazis were back. The Nazis were back in the 1960s. Ku Klux Klan going crazy, escalating to bombing churches, not just killing individuals, but bombing churches. That was the Ku Klux Klan. Very strong right wing, growing, growing, growing. And on the left, tremendous growth on the left. So, what about the 60s? I had to admit, the 1960s was the period of the greatest progress that we made in the second half of the 20th century. So my understanding of what polarization does must be wrong. 
But how can I wrap my mind around it? So I happened by that time to be traveling through Britain doing a book tour because by that time, the book that, that uh, the researching that I was doing, uh, the, that book came out, Viking Economics. And it, it, it does describe their economies and why their economies work so much better than ours in terms of you know, the, the values that we've got. But it also tells the truth about their big leap forward in the 19. 20s and 30s. And I was, so I was going from town to town. A lot of Brits were coming to the meetings because British people are fascinated with what's going on on the other side of the, the North Sea. You know, I, I think it's resentment, to tell you the truth. I think it's jealousy. <laughs> it's like uh, the Brits really want to be the best in the world. Let's face it, they're very ego involved, I think. And they didn't really, they weren't really happy that the, the Nordics were doing better than they were. So they were, com they were really like, you know, coming to libraries and places like this, just in throngs. And, um, and one, one night I was staying overnight, uh, given hospitality by a Quaker who was an artist, and he had his uh, artwork around the house, and I, like Johnny, Johnny's an artist, he has his work, uh, artwork around the house. And uh, so I was wandering around, you know, looking at this beautiful stuff. And he had lately shifted his focus to um, metal, and so he was making gorgeous metal sculptures. And I was puzzled as anything. How can you make metal be beautiful like that, like, like he was doing it? So I asked him, and he said, oh, come on, come on, I'll show you. So he takes me out through the kitchen into the backyard, and out there's the studio, and we go into the studio, and he proudly presents his forge. He said, I had to apprentice with a blacksmith find out how to use a forge, because you're right, metal doesn't want to do what I want it to do, so I had to figure out how to make it malleable. And a forge will do that for me, <laughs> as well as for blacksmiths who make horseshoes, right? So I learned how to use a forge, and you know, that makes the metal malleable, and then I can do what I want with it. And I said, thank you. I wanted to hug the guy. He didn't look like he would appreciate it, but so I didn't. But I said, you have given me a metaphor that I can use to understand polarization. Polarization is a forge heating up society, making it malleable. Institutions that look very stiff and, and you know, concrete start getting malleable. They start melting. Like we used to have an institution uh, called when a presidential candidate loses the election, they go away. Right. <laughs> Anybody remember that? that you, no. yeah. <laughs> now, I run into Americans as I run around the country wondering what's going to be the result of the next election. Not who's going to win, but what's going to be the result. You know. Yeah, institutions get malleable. They get soft. They get variable during polarization, which, on the one hand, enabled these people to make their big leap forward because things had gotten malleable. They were able to make a bigger leap than they could have earlier. It helped us in the 1930s make gains that we couldn't make in the 1920s. Polarization helps things get malleable, makes advances possible. And dangerous, and dangerous, exactly right. You put your finger right on it. Yeah. Polarization in the 1920s in Germany, right, and 30s. Communist movement growing like crazy. Nazis growing like crazy. The outcome, as you say, was Nazism and Hitler. And in Italy, the same thing in the same period, a little bit before, tremendous polarization and Mussolini came out on top and the fascists. Uh, for one thing, that means that the forge, as a metaphor, it helps me to think about the forge not as having an opinion about how things should work out. Right. Right? So it's not the polarization forced Nazism here as an outcome, you know, if, quite a different outcome. It, it's not that when we polarized, we had a Nazi outcome, but Germany sure did. And Italy sure had a fascist outcome. So it seems like the forge really doesn't care. It just heats the metal. You know, if, you wanna, if you're a blacksmith, make horseshoes. Forge is happy. <laughs> if you're an artist, make art. Forge is happy. 
If I had a forge to work with, frankly, I would make junk. But, because I have no idea what to do with the forge. But the, uh, but the, the, uh, the forge would, would be happy. Happy to make the, the metal supple for me or for anybody else. So we get to be the artists. We get to decide. Increasingly malleable institutions, what shall we do in this opportunity? So as soon as that hit me, I read another book. Some of us just can't help ourselves. It's called, it's called How We Win. So it explains this polarization thing and it says, so if you want to really, another, I guess farming analogy would be make hay while the sun shines, <laughs> right? If you really want to take advantage of this opportunity, this is how we do it. And so I wrote the, uh, wrote the book How We Win, which is a kind of uh, manual. It's not really a narrative like my uh, memoir is. It's, it's a, like how to do this, how to do that, how to make a coalition, how to do this. Like, um, jumping in and trying to organize people and take advantage of this moment, what, what, do, you, what do you say about like, who, to, who to organize? I would say the left should be organizing the middle with a vision. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, like, I agree. How many people are really worried about medical care? Mm -hmm. And increasingly. It keeps getting to be a worse and worse situation. Rural hospitals shutting down, maternity wards shutting down, stuff like that. So I would say left, organize the middle. The middle will be more effective at organizing the right or talking to the right, engaging in dialogue with the right, than we will. Because the right's busy obsessing about how horrible we are. We left, right? They are fascinated with us. We're, what do they call us? Woke and stuff like that, right? They make up. They make up language and stuff like that. So they are just fast. I don't know why they waste their time so much, but they, they just waste their time trying to focus on us. We, some, I've run into leftists who kind of get obsessed with the right, and I, all of that's a waste of time. Uh, but what, what matters is to sell our vision to people in the middle, and because they're not the woke people, whatever, um, they can talk with the people on the, on the right, and they'll get some of them, but not all of them.